Greetings. Warm welcome back to Inner Sections, where our aspiration is to allow us to explore the fullest potentialities in humanity, in our own nature, and in the collective constructs of teams, organizations, and institutions. And we, we seek to do that by challenging some of the um, confining constructs of the past. We do that by seeking to dissolve the boundaries between inner and outer and, and east and west and science and spirituality and profit and purpose and any of these kinds of divides that sometimes we end up just um, you know getting very limited by in everything we do. And it is for me a great thrill today to be inviting us into a space that is as deep as your core unspoken invisible beliefs. As I shared with you in a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, you know, as he said, your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, and your values become your destiny. Now, the very root of all of that are your beliefs. And I can't think of a more fitting and inspiring guest for us to have in our midst to talk on this topic than Dr. David Burns. We have had the honor of having David with us in a past webcast as well. And as I thought about this theme, this topic, the centrality and importance of this for today's time, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't just help but recognize that we kind of have to go back to, to the master, to the expert, to David, to help us navigate our way through this very important inner, very deep landscape. Just a quick reminder about who it is that we are interacting with today. David is a renowned cognitive behavior therapist, a psychiatrist. He has an MD from the Stanford School of Medicine. He has also worked at the University of Pennsylvania, now serves as a professor, researcher, and trainer at Stanford. He has uh, trained a large, you know, uh, multi-generation community of therapists, 50,000 of them over the last uh, 40 years. He's had over 35,000 therapy sessions himself and um, has done uh, path-breaking research, you know, and and uh, you know, and, and published in this area around themes like relationships, depression, anxiety, trauma. How to how to eliminate pain, and then how to ultimately you know find gain and flourishing in what we do in life and at work. He's the author of a a, a best-selling book on this topic that continues to be a classic, you know, in this area. Feeling good, the new mood therapy. He has since then most recently published Feeling Great, which is a refresh on this topic based on the advancements in his thinking and research and practice and experience over the last several years. I'm going to highly recommend this book for any of us who wants to continue down this path, you know, after this conversation today. He's won numerous awards for his uh, outstanding work in this area. And without further ado, you know, it is a great joy and pleasure for me to have back in our midst the, um, yeah, inimitable Dr. David Burns. Thank you so much. It's always fun to talk to you, either privately or in, in a, a, a webcast like this. And uh, I'm just honored and excited to be on the show. I think it'll be fun, and I hope it'll be fun and provide maybe provide some uh, helpful direction for the people who are watching as well. Yeah. Yeah. David, I, I know that this is going to be a feast. This is going to be a feast for all of us. Um, let me ask you this. Um, you have been working in this space, this very subtle space of emotions and of thoughts. At what stage in the evolution of cognitive behavior therapy and of your own work, did you recognize the presence of something? I don't know if this is the appropriate word, you know, in your more expert way of thinking about it, but the presence of something even more powerful and even more invisible than just thoughts and emotions, which is this matrix of beliefs. Well, that aspect actually developed uh, really early, surprisingly, back in the 1970s when we were first creating and developing cognitive therapy. You know, the basic idea was your your emotions result from your thoughts in the here and now, what you're telling yourself at, at every moment. And when people are depressed, they're giving themselves negative messages like, you know, I'm not good enough. I shouldn't have screwed up. I'm I'm a loser. I'm a failure. Uh, you know, I, I should be doing so much better with, with my life or, uh, you know, maybe something bad happens, uh, 
one of my students, her, her, her boyfriend re rejected him. And then she told herself, I'm, I'm worthless, I'm unlovable, I'll, I'll be alone forever. And it's, it's those kind of distorted, cruel messages that cause depression and anxiety. But we were always wondering, well, what causes people to have those dis distorted messages? What, wh where do they come from? What, how, how does that happen? And so the idea is that we all have certain b beliefs, uh, our, our value systems at, at perhaps the deepest level. And there are certain uh, beliefs that can set us up for, for failure, for, for pain. Uh, and and uh, I've, I've given a list of 23 common self-defeating beliefs like uh, perfectionism, perceived perfectionism, achievement addiction, love addiction, approval addiction, uh, and on and on. And the way it works is, is we have these beliefs going on all the time in our minds, like many of the people watching right now have the perfectionism or, or, or the achievement addiction, which is, I should always uh, try to be perfect, or uh, second best isn't good enough, uh, or my worthwhileness as a human being depends on my achievements and, 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 my, and my productivity. And so if you have, uh, say, this achievement addiction and you're doing well, uh, th then, then you're going to be really happy because you'll say, "Oh my gosh, I'm I'm achieving, therefore, you know, I'm a I'm a worthwhile person right now because I, I just had a success with with Project X." But we would predict that you would be vulnerable to anxiety and and depression when you fail or when when you're in in danger of failure, and and so one of the ideas behind the uh, the original cognitive therapy that I wrote about and feeling good was that if you can change these self-defeating beliefs as well as the negative thoughts in the here and now, see the negative thoughts are just when you're upset, but your beliefs are with you all the time. And if you could develop a more robust value system, change these beliefs that have the ability to, to make you miserable, then you'll be less likely to have painful mood swings in the future. And, and not only can you recover, but you can move to a deeper level in, in, in your life in, in terms of your spiritual growth or personal growth or however way you want to look at it. Now, I've lost your sound here. Okay, sorry about that. It's reminding me of a story. Uh, you know, it might be apocryphal, but uh, it's about this king who was, um, you know, feeling very challenged about about life, and then he meets this uh, wise, you know, wise soul, and um, he asks that wise soul, "Is there some one simple piece of advice that you can give me, which I can repeat to myself, both at times when I'm experiencing euphoric highs as well as really depressing lows, that will ground me?" Just one piece of advice that will ground me, and uh, so that um, that man he uh, he he looks at him, you know, uh, with understanding, and he says, "Yes, you know, just tell yourself in every one of those moments, the super high ones as well as the super low ones, that this too shall pass." Yeah, right. And uh, and uh, I really like that, as I'm sure you yeah. you, you are as well, David. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, one of the things in what you just said is very powerful, which is that in order to train us, you know, in in um, mastering this kind of like this swirl of feelings that go up and down, we have to not just be vigilant in the tough times to do the do the right work. But I think you also said that if you if you get like to feel too attached, you know, to the successes when when, when they're coming to you, then you are addicting yourself to them in some ways. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's right. And for for me, uh, you know, this this perfectionism and achievement addiction were, you know, one of my many flaws and, and afflictions. And I know early in my career, I hope I'm not repeating myself from a previous uh, podcast, but I, I was walking with a, a friend, John Rush, who was in my residency class at, at, at Penn, and he was a brilliant guy. He was one of the pioneers in cognitive therapy and developed a subsequently a tremendous uh, career in biological psychiatry and, and I think uh, Southwestern Medical Center in, in Dallas or something something in, in, in Texas. But he, he was saying to me, uh, oh, I, I feel sorry for these people who think they have to be able to, to, to cure every patient. 
And I, I, I said, oh, John, you're, you're right. That, that's such a stupid thing. Uh, but in my mind, I was saying, no, John, you're wrong. <laughs> people like you shouldn't try to cure every patient, but people like me can cure every patient. And there was a, you know, positive, a kind of a rush, I'm going to achieve this, th th this greatness. And, and there is a kind of an addiction because in the early part of my career, I got referred all these extraordinarily difficult patients from uh, Dr. Beck's clinic. I thought he was referring all these patients to me because he thought I was great. And then I discovered that his intake group there would refer to me anyone they didn't want <laughs> that they thought was too difficult. And, and so when I would uh, be able to cure these incredibly difficult patients, I'd get a rush. And I'd say, oh my gosh, this is, this is great. And you know, it propelled me to, to improve my skills and I developed ton, tons of techniques. But the downside of it was that when I had a patient who said, you know, Dr. Burns, you're not helping me. It was a threat to my ego, to my, to my sense of self-esteem and, and, and brought tension in, in, into the therapeutic relationship. And one day, you know, I, I finally decided to, to, to try to let go of this perfectionism. And, and a patient said to me, you know, Dr. Burns, you're not helping me. And, and instead of trying to prove that I could help them, I just said, you know, what you're saying is, is right and it's painful for me because I really like you, I respect you, I care for you. I, I believe that we can, we can do tremendous work together and get you out of this depression. But so far I've, I've failed terribly and I, I feel sad and, and ashamed and you're probably angry and, and, and ticked off and disappointed. Tell me about those feelings. I really want to hear what you have to say. So at that moment I was surrendering my sense of self, my sense of trying to achieve, my sense of trying to be perfect. And then suddenly the heavens opened up and the patient began to cry and to open up and to talk about his feelings. And, and all of a sudden we were on the same page and got connected and then the therapy opened up and he, he did tremendously well and, 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 and recovered. And I began to discover that this, uh, this belief system that I had, which on some level brought me a lot of success, motivated to work my butt off in my research and my clinical work, had a kind of uh, sneaky downside to it. And that, and that began to shift my thinking uh, in, in pretty radical, pretty radical ways. It helped me when I was writing my, my, my new book, Feeling Great, which was just, just released. And I was working on it for several years because there's all these new developments since I wrote my first book, Feeling Good. But when I was writing it, I, I wasn't thinking about oh, how many books are going to sell and who's going to be impressed with this. I was just saying, this is fun because I can connect with my readers. I can share these ideas and I don't really care, you know, how many books it sells or how, how successful it is. For, for me, the joy is in the process of, of doing what I'm doing, con connecting with someone who's reading it, who's in a tremendous amount of pain. And it just makes life for me uh, so much sweeter, so much more pleasurable, so much more rewarding. And that's what the Buddha called the death of the, of the self. Unfortunately, we, we don't remain dead for long. We get reincarnated. And reincarnation is something that occurs when you're alive. Maybe it can occur after, after your body has died, but you can certainly die and, and be reborn over and over dur during your lifetime. But the ego comes back and we get trapped back into thinking, oh, I've got to be so great. And, you know, you, you get hooked. I don't Did you ever see the movie The Devil's Advocate? Yeah. Isn't that a great one? Yeah, it was a great, great movie. About the ego and and and, uh, but but that but that's what it, it it's all about is, is is letting the self die. And people are afraid of the death of the self, afraid to give up these these ideas, afraid you're going to become second rate or uh, somehow lose your motivation, or that something terrible is going to happen. So we fight for life. But when you die, it's like a magical discovery when yourself dies you instantly come come back to life it's not the great death it's the great rebirth it's yeah. like getting out of out of a mental prison and suddenly you're you're alive and and life becomes filled with with so much joy and and opportunities for connection with people and uh but anyway that that's kind of a lot of babbling i'm doing but that that's kind of what what it's about to a certain extent 
Well, that's a beautiful metaphor. Uh, what I'm hearing you say is that certain self-defeating beliefs are sort of like delusions in our consciousness. Yeah. That keep us, in a sense, in a state of sleep. And when you are able to recognize and vanquish them, then you actually become awake. You know, that's the rebirth yeah. you're talking about, the reincarnation. You, you become awake and you become even more aware and alive, right, of, of the world. And, and yeah. my, my spiritual master, Yogananda, he, he, he would say something like, uh, you know, as you grow in that direction, uh, what you were seeing as unreal becomes real. And what you see as real becomes unreal. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that kind of like idea uh, resonates that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Now, one thing in my career, you know, I love this spiritual talk, but the, uh, which is fantastic and so exciting and so valid. But the problem is most people don't get it. You know, they just hear words of what does that mean? Death and rebirth of the self. Well, oh, God, I'm going to lose myself. That's terrible. You can't stand the thought. And, and people don't, don't get it. And it's like seeing the Grand Canyon for the first time. You see something that you'd only heard about, or you saw it on a postcard, or you saw it on TV, a helicopter flying over the Grand Canyon, but you can't you can't get it until you've seen it. The first time I saw it, I was with a, a friend from college, and we were hitchhiking from my home in Phoenix back to Amherst College, and uh, we had this old jalopy we were supposed to drive to Chicago. And so the first night we drove, got to the edge of the Grand Canyon, I, I, I although I, you know, I was living in Phoenix, I'd never seen the Grand Canyon, and, and we parked there, and we had sleeping bags, and we put them on the ground next to the car, and, uh, you know, went to sleep, and when I woke up, I realized we'd put our sleeping bags within six inches of the edge of the Grand Canyon, and when I woke up, I was just, my head was on this, the edge of the cliff, and the sun was coming up, and I saw the Grand Canyon from the first time, and it, it took my breath away, and I thought, my gosh, I heard it was a big hole in the ground, but I never knew it was like this. And and that's what the, the, the death of the self is it, it, like. It, it's like suddenly seeing something fantastic for the first time. But what I've done with my career is to focus on the scientific and practical aspects. How do we lead people step by step to this awareness? And so, uh, you know, I've, I've sat you and I think you can post for the viewers this list of 23 self-defeating beliefs and, and also what I call a cost-benefit analysis. So what, what are some specific steps that listeners could take right now if you wanted to pinpoint your own self-defeating beliefs? Because there, there's a whole lot of them. It's not just the achievement addiction. There's 20, 23 of them. And, and then uh, have, what would be the steps if you wanted to change one of these self-defeating beliefs so that you'd have more more joy and, and, and peace and, uh, and, 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 and love in, in your life. Wonderful. Let's do that, David. Thank you for that suggestion. So I'm going to ask my colleague Anobik to um, post in the chat window a link to the self-defeating beliefs. And as you are doing that, Anobik, let me see if I can, in fact, also bring them up here on my screen. And maybe if it makes sense, David, what we could do is invite our friends here who are with us live to have a look at these. And I mean, if you're open to it, I'd love to have you all just in the chat window, share like one of these beliefs that you are really immediately resonating with, right? That you look at that belief and you say, wow, you know, to be honest, that's kind of me. Like I, I, I get into that kind of, you know, like trap or that kind of way of thinking from time to time, right? And so why don't we, why don't we do that? Give me one second, and I'm going to just like post oh. it up here in in just um, in just a minute. Bear with me as I uh, just make this happen. And Anubik, you could uh, you know hopefully you can just kind of put it up there as well into into chat, so that those of you who want a copy of this beyond just the confines of our time here today, you will be able to um, you know keep, keep access to it. I think we have posted it, and and then again for those of you who are not able to see the chat, you know here they are. Uh, David, this is your list. So, would you like to introduce uh, people to this? Sure, sure. There's there's different categories uh, that, like the first three, are the achievement cluster, perfectionism, uh, perceived perfectionism, which is a term I coined, and, and this was another affliction I had that uh, people will not love and accept me as a flawed and vulnerable human being, and I I believe that uh, for many years. Uh, the the uh, 
the achievement addiction, my worth depends on my achievements. And then the, the next cluster, I can see halfway down on my screen, I can see down to number five. I yeah, but, but by the way, David, I just wanted to highlight um, the achievement addiction is the most um, pervasive self-defeating belief amongst my students, you know, in the MBA and executive MBA programs. When I, when I do a class on this topic and introduce some of your ideas, that's the one <laughs> that is the most yeah. popular. Yeah, that's that's widespread. But another in culture in general is the love cluster, the the uh, approval addiction. I need everyone's approval to to be worthwhile, uh, and the love addiction. I, I I I can't feel happy and fulfilled as a human being unless I'm loved. I must have love to to feel to feel happiness, to feel joy. Uh, you know, uh, the fear of rejection is, is, is so common uh, too, uh, or pleasing others, submissiveness. I, I should always please everyone and conflict phobia. Pe people who love each other uh, shouldn't, shouldn't fight. I've seen so many people who, who, whose lives were really dealt a heavy blow because of uh, conflict phobia and, and thinking thinking they they're not allowed to be angry and and they should always be you know happy and and and, and joyous and and, and th th there's just many of them another one in your population would be number 23 the superman superwoman uh, i should always be strong and never be weak i should always be successful i should always uh, yes answers. that's uh, a big one and then the demandingness cluster causes relationship problems, uh, other blame. You know, if you show me a hundred uh, people with relationship problems, troubled marriage or ticked off at a colleague or a family member, 80% uh, of the time, 90% of the time, they'll be blaming the other person. Uh, David, we have to come back at some point and do a conversation with you on relationships. Yeah, we'll leave it for for now. But that that's yeah, that absolutely blaming others, and entitlement, think entitled to have people treat me in the way I want. Uh, truth, I'm right, and 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 you're wrong. That that's uh, that that's huge. Isn't huge. that like something that is like you know, if you want to think what painfully so all of America is stricken with right now? Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's that's right. This has become a, na a national uh, uh, epidemic. We got the pandemic, but we got the epidemic, the blame epidemic. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, seeing yourself as superior to other people, looking down on them, uh, thinking they need punishment, uh, thinking that everything is their fault and not looking at your own role in the problem. And that's another form of enlightenment. That's a second death of the self. And this is a, a very painful death of the self to, to to, to look at your own role in, in a problem. I hate doing it myself. When I'm ticked off at someone, I'm, I'm, I'm certain it's the other person's fault. And that belief just makes the problem worse and worse. And finally, I, I stop and, and say, okay, David, use your tools, look at your own role in this problem. And when I see it and it's there 100% of the time, uh, it, it, it just kills me. It, I, I feel extremely ashamed when I see my own insensitivity, my own flaws. But if, if you're willing to endure that pain and to share that with humility to the person who you're ticked off at, uh, that, that's another death of the self and another rebirth. Because when your defenses come down, their defenses will come down. You both end, end up in, in, in heaven. But it, it, it's, a, it's a death of the self that many people are terrified of uh, and, and will put up a lot of resistance to, to examining their own role. And you hear that in politics. You don't hear people saying, here's the errors that I've been making. They, they, all they say is, here's where you're screwed up. Here's where I'm right, you're wrong, you're to blame. And I'm, I'm, I'm innocent, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm perfect. And that works in a, in a sense. People are looking for someone who knows all the, all the answers. And, and, and so just as our perfectionism and achievement addiction addicts, addicts us with, with certain rewards, this narcissistic hostility and, and splitting people into groups also uh, ha has rewards because some people want to hear that. They want to line up behind this, uh, this narcissistic uh, guru or, 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 or leader who is all powerful and know, knows all of the answers. And, and that, that leads to the uh, other kinds of suffering, the suffering of, uh, of cruelty, of, of war, of hostility, mar marital con conflict. Yeah, we could do a great show on, on that. 
Yeah, I mean, as you're thinking, thoughts are getting sparked in my head because um, I, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, David, that uh, it's not just an affliction that can impact our, you know, intimate, closer relationships, but also just our, you know, views of what kind of a society we want to create. Yeah. Uh, what kind of an organization we want to create, what kind of a culture we want to create in our teams. I have to show a professor from Harvard Business School, uh, Amy Edmondson, who's done some great work around um, embracing failure and learning from failure and creating a psychologically safe environment where people can be open to talk about their vulnerabilities and things that are not going well, not just like what's perfect and great and high performance. And um, when I draw a link between that conversation and what we were just saying here, one of the implications that's coming to me is, you know, I've been watching, for example, of course, it's like the presidential debate season now. And um, in general, in politics, we have, you know, evolved to a place where it's really sort of like considered to be inappropriate to ever accept any vulnerability on your side, ever yeah. that you've ever made any mistake, that you've changed your point of view. You know, you can, you know, I mean, like, it's considered to be like an, a sign of inauthenticity if you had one point of view and you changed it, you know, but that's yeah. really kind of an evolving individual, uh, you know, and all of that. So somehow it's because there's a pressure from people to look perfect, right? To look perfect yeah. as a leader. And strong and to learn, 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 be strong and yeah. powerful. Yeah, yep. yeah. Uh, so, David. Meanwhile, our friends here have been offering their, um, you know, th th their, you know, their favorite self-defeating beliefs as they they relate to them. So, Anna is talking about achievement addiction. Uh, Sohail is talking about the first three, all around the same themes. Yep. Amit is talking about pleasing others. Cheryl, perfectionism. Kamala, achievement again. Uh, Jen, superwoman. Um, and then uh, fear of rejection from Alexandra. So you're just getting a sense of how people are relating to some of these themes. Achievement addiction again from Cheryl, uh, Lisa again achievement. I mean, so yeah, you're right. You know, these ones are among the most common for our kind of demographic, the people who are, you know, part of our community. You know, Superman, Superwoman from Natasha, uh, Superwoman again from Lisa, pleasing others, achievement addiction. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so I, I think you know the ones that you were talking about are clearly, you know, uh, resonating with, with everyone. Yeah. Here. Well, let's see if we can cure a couple people. Yeah, well, so here's the thing. Like you call them, you call them self-defeating beliefs, but let me challenge that idea. Um, I mean, isn't it good to have a certain commitment to achievement and perfection and all of these things? Because isn't that how some of the greatest work in the world gets done? I mean, people who are very comfortable in compromising the standards, and doing more kind of loose work and not having ambition and drive, doesn't that lead to ultimately mediocrity, you know, of some kind? And so, yeah, I mean, I, I just wonder if there's a risk here if we too quickly become very just comfortable and complacent with all kinds of flaws and flubs and all of that. That's exactly right. And that's how, how we get hooked. And, and uh, I've also uh, attached uh, a, a cost benefit analysis. Uh, that uh, perhaps people can see in the chat box or, or wherever you're posting this document. But let we, why don't we do a group uh, 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 cost-benefit analysis for the belief, uh, you know, I should be perfect and, and my worthwhileness depends on my achievements. And there are many ways that that belief can help you. There are many benefits to having this belief. And let, let's see if we can list what they are. And one bit of a subtle point, we're not going to list the advantages and disadvantages of achievement. There, there's no disadvantages of achievement. We're going to list the advantages and disadvantages of linking your, son, your sense of self-esteem, your worthwhileness with, with your achievements. Or, or, or with being perfect or, or trying to be perfect. Let's, and and if, if you're watching the, the show right now, you could just take a piece of paper, which is how I'm doing it. I just took a piece of paper because I don't have that printed one. The printed one is nice, but I just drew a line down the middle and call, labeled the left-hand column advantages and the right-hand column disadvantages. So what are some of the advantages, and people maybe can put this in the chat, of uh, perfectionism and, and linking linking your self-esteem to your achievements. And, and I'll list, I'll, I'll mention the first one because it's what Hitendra, what, what you just said. If you have this uh, achievement addiction, it, it will uh, m motivate you uh, to, uh, to, to work 
hard. And number two, your, your hard work uh, uh, will lead to increased uh, uh, pr productivity. And that's how it was, you know, early in my own career with, 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 with my research. Uh, I kept telling me myself that, that this research ha has to be fantastic. And when I thought my research was going well, I would get euphoric and say, this is going to be the greatest study in the world type of thing. And then when the data started not coming out right or something wasn't working or I couldn't answer some puzzle in the lab, I, I would really kind of get panicky and crash and, and you know, go, go to the down and down in the dump. So there's two benefits. What, what are some more, Hitendra, and what are people putting in? Maybe they can put in the chat box. What are some additional advantages of perfectionism and basing your self-esteem on your achievements? Because there's a ton of benefits. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, perfectionism is a beautiful ideal to have, right? Because um, why would we not from you know the level of our inner core, our soul, not seek perfection. You know, from you know every thought, speech, and action that we engage in, uh, it's a beautiful quest to go on. Yeah. I, I I saw this documentary, David. Um, Anobik will recognize it well. Anobik, who, who, you know, can can you remind me um, the, the name name of our uh, free solo gentleman who who climbed way, you know up there, Al Capitan, you know, all of that. Uh, yeah, just come in and share. Oh, you're on mute. Me? Uh, yeah, it's Alex Arnold. Yeah, yeah, Alex Arnold, right? So, so David, here's here's this man who's done this incredible thing of doing free solo, right? That that climb up just by himself. Oh. On it's a documentary. It's an inspiring, incredible documentary. And you wonder why is an individual like him willing to take this kind of a risk, right? And of course, seek to become so honed in his craft. That he can he can he can kind of latch on to every small little notch of like some like projection yeah. of a rock somewhere and right. kind of dizzying heights and all of that. And there's a moment very soulful in that movie where he's asked that question and he reflects and he says, It's because I hunger for perfection. Because yeah. in free solo, even one small tiny error for a small fleeting moment would be enough to just like make your not just career collapse, but make you die. And so yeah. the only way it will work is if you are a hundred percent perfect and that's the hunger in me. Yeah. So and we can put on the advantages column, it, 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 life becomes a beautiful quest, a, a, a journey of mag that magical journey. And that's, that's a fantastic thing. What are some other benefits of basing your self-esteem on your achievements uh, and, and, uh, Try, try to be perfect, try to achieve perfection. Yeah, let's see what our friends are saying in, in, the, in the chat window. We, we're hearing some really great like ideas here. Um, uh, boy, I mean, there's so many. Uh, thank you for offering these up, folks. So Anna is saying it gives you more opportunities. I'm assuming what you mean is that, you know, you start like succeeding more and therefore more people are respecting you and giving you more projects, more, more you know, more breakthroughs, more, you know, more resources, more support. Uh, Cheryl is saying it drives you to more creativity because I guess yeah. it makes you keep thinking and solutionizing and coming up with better and better and better ideas. Um, you know, Anna is again saying you know, it gives you a strong focus. So you're very, very committed and focused now. Uh, Cornelia is saying you know, it, it allows you to track and get things done and holds you accountable, holds you accountable to a high standard. Right? Yeah. Lisa's talking about look, if I achieve, I feel proud. And it motivates me to work even harder and, and, and even better. Uh, and then Abina is, is saying, like, you know, it, it, it commits you to growth, you know, constantly looking to making you more capable about, you know, uh, what, you, what, you, what you can do. Um, and Radha is talking about how it motivates yourself. But yeah, anyway, I mean, we've been seeing like argument upon argument, right? Philippe is talking about how it gives you a yep. standard yeah. stuff like that. And this stuff is all absolutely valid. And uh, also, you know, when you win, people love a winner. So you'll get a lot of adulation. And, and, and also, people will admire you just for your work ethic. They'll say, oh, like, you know, I remember when I was little, uh, the uh, neighbor asked me to rake the leaves or something. I must have been six years old. Uh, and uh, and so I, I was very perfectionistic and I, I, it was going to give me 25 cents or something. And it was this big yard and I was just raking it and raking it. It took me forever. 
and then I remember uh, somebody said, "If you if you ever want a job done right, give it to David." <laughs> so people really really admire that about you. And then another thing that people haven't mentioned is, is that when you say, "I'm I'm I'm going to be perfect," I'm going to try to be perfect. It, it you're projecting the idea that you're one cut above other people, that you're in that superior group because you you wouldn't expect an average person to try to be perfect because, oh, that's not going to be realistic for you. So you're kind of get, attaining this status of one of the beautiful people, one, one of the superior people. So uh, that, there's all of that and, and probably more, but I've got at least 12 or 13 things listed in my advantages column. Now, what are the disadvantages? Is there any uh, downside to basing our self-esteem uh, on our achievements and, and, and trying, to be, trying to be perfect? Yeah, so um, I'm so going to write... I'll say one just to get it started, is that when, when you fail or when you're in danger of failure, you're, you're going you're, you're gonna to crash and, and, uh, and, and, and be in danger of uh, pretty intense anxiety when you think you're maybe going to fail, as well as a depression and a feeling of inadequacy or, or inferiority or worthlessness when, when you fail. So you'll have a fear of, of, of failure. Any other disadvantages? Right. I'm um, I'm looking at the chat window to see what else is coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Laura's talking about stress. You know, you're gonna have um, more stress in your life because of that dependency you have towards like, are you winning or are you losing? I'm guessing, Laura, that's what you're saying. Um, and then Cheryl is talking about, uh, uh, you know, it's it's never enough. You know, you you're you're constantly kind of you know feeling pushed to do and want more and more. Anna's talking about how it leads to a lot of internal pressure on you. Um, Vivian is talking about how it's like a fixed mindset. Vivian, can you weigh in more on how you're associating this um, with a fixed mindset? Um, it'll be helpful to hear more of your thoughts there. Uh, Felipe is saying it gives power to the outer world. Uh, I'm guessing what you mean is that your happiness, your sense of fulfillment is no longer in your hands, in your control. It depends on the conditions of the outside. You are feeling a hero, suddenly coronavirus comes and maybe eliminates certain projects in your life and you can't be with certain people and you can't you know, get the adulation and respect or whatever. And so now you're feeling like a zero because like you you don't have what you were addicted to from the outside. Uh, you know, Anna's talking about rigidity. Uh, you know, Deepak is talking about it can take you forever if you're just aiming for perfection, it can take you forever and make you inefficient. That quote reminds me, that thought reminds me of a quote from, um, I forget who it is. It's one of the you know, great thinkers of the past. Uh, I think one of the European philosophers. And he said, um, you know, uh, great is the enemy. Or, what is it? <laughs> you know, or perfect is the enemy of good or something. In, in, in other words, you know, in a quest to be, you know, perfect, we tend to often compromise the ability to do anything because we're always paralyzed. Uh, yeah. We can just get to perfection. So anyway, there are a bunch of others, really great thoughts here, David, but um, how are you feeling about this so far? Oh, it's great. People are doing a beautiful job. I'm really excited about what's happening. It's always so much fun to work with you and uh, live and uh, make, I just feel like that what we're doing is just so vital and, and so fun. And, and another thing going along with that fixed mindset is, is that, you know, from a Buddhist perspective, and I know nothing about Buddhism, but I love to, to bullshit about it, and that seems good enough for most people, but there's no such thing as success or failure. Those are just mental constructs. And uh, from an experience of failure can be uh, a tremendous opportunity to learn and grow. In my teaching at Stanford, I have a free weekly seminar, uh, a training group for community therapists, as well as Stanford uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, and students, and, and, and to practice and, and to learn superb empathy skills and, and how to, how to how more, way more effective forms of psychotherapy. But we do role plays and we teach like the disarming technique and, you know, the thought empathy and feeling empathy and, and you know, various techniques of paradoxical uh, you know, uh, agenda setting, you know, pretty, pretty powerful but hard hard to, to grasp techniques and, and we we model them and show how easy and beautiful then they are and then they have to break into groups of two and three and 
and, and practice and get a grade instantly. And most of them get uh, pretty bad grades pretty much every time. And, and, and it's shocking, they, they discover that their empathy skills are very poor. And these are people who are many have been successful therapists in, in the community. And it's, it's kind of a shock to the system. And so we, we practice the concept of joyous failure or learning through failure, that if you check your ego at the door, then those exercises can add fantastic dimensions and skill, not only to your therapeutic skills, but to your personal life and, and your relationships with, with colleagues as well. But that's another thing that, that you, you learn, uh, you lose when, 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 you're, when you're not allowed to fail, when you, when you have to be perfect and, 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 and so forth. And, and there could be health things too. I know a young woman who is incredible achiever, a beautiful woman, uh, gracious, uh, warm, uh, very hardworking, uh, you know, very, very accomplished, but, but she struggles with migraine headaches. Now, I don't know if there's a cause and effect there, but somebody said that there's this uh, stress, that, the, that, the, that this internal tension, you know, what, what, you know, what, what if I'm not, not, not good enough? Well, we could add to the list, uh, and uh, but then the thing to do is there's two circles at the bottom, uh, you know, of, of, of your lists, like a, a line with two, with two circles. If we go down to the bottom of that, uh, th there you go. And now put two numbers in those circles to see what what's greater for you, the benefits of uh, achievement, uh, achievement addiction and trying to be perfect or the disadvantages and put two numbers that add up to a hundred. It's like if they're about equal, it would be 50-50. If the benefits outweigh the disadvantages, it might be 60-40 or 90-10. And if the cost of, of the, these beliefs is greater, uh, then it might be 40 on the left and 60 on the right, or, or 35 on the left and, and 65 uh, on the right. So do your, your weighting now and then uh, put 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 the numbers in the chat uh, so we can uh, report what they are, and then I'll I'll talk about what what do you do next based on how these numbers uh, come out. We have a little silence here, which I guess is okay, but maybe you can uh, tell us what what you're seeing in the chat. Yeah, so you're seeing. Um invite everyone to kind of do the math for themselves and then see see what the numbers look like right so yeah, yeah it's not how many are in each column but but how how do the how important are we doing? yeah 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 because one advantage could outweigh five disadvantages or, or vice versa but to the benefits see there's real benefits yeah. this. when i had this system in my research i won the top award in the world for an investigator uh, younger than 35 years of age for research on, on neurochemistry or, 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 you know, brain basic research on, on, on how the brain works. And that, that was a tremendous benefit of, of, of my perfectionism. I studied a paper from the National Institute of Mental Health. I, I, I found that their methodology was poor and I thought they'd come to the wrong conclusion and they pretty complex study of, of, of brain chemistry, the so-called chemical imbalance theory. And, and I redid this study in a very perfectionistic way and came to the opposite conclusion. And that's the paper that I won the, won the award for. So the, the benefits are real and, and then the downside is real. How do they, how do they weigh out in your mind? Yeah, so um, we're getting some scores here. Um, you know, 30, 70, um, 70, 30, uh, 65, 35. So people people are seeing, um, you know, uh, 70 advantage and 30 disadvantage. Uh, yeah. 30, 60. So we've been seeing interesting, interesting contrast. So, uh, you know, I mean, uh, they're definitely not skewed all the way to one end or the other. Uh, they're in that 70, 30, 65, 35, and 40, 60 kind of range. Yeah, so that's great. Yeah. Sometimes the advantages are more, sometimes disadvantages more. What would yeah. your advice be for people for whom they're seeing, you know, more disadvantages than advantages? Well, let's look at the other side first. If it's okay. working for you, if the advantages are greater, and I like to think of the Buddha who sits, you know, with, with open hands. I don't know if you can see this on, on the video or, oh yeah, here, you know, kind of like with his hands like this. 
and and, and what is, why does he sit like that? Well, to me, the open hands means uh, uh, I, I can accept you and show you the path to enlightenment if that's what you want. But I can also let go, you know, if I don't need to, to have you follow my teachings or, or, or receive what I have to offer. And so if it's working for you, and I know for, for me it was working for, for, for years, then there's no, no reason to change. Uh, I see myself, my role is, is to help people who are hurting, uh, who, 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 who are saying that th this, is, this is getting in, in, in the way. And so if the disadvantages are greater, uh, th then we, we can take the next step. And the next step is, is just an intellectual step. And then after that, we want to take an emotional step. But the intellectual step is if you're going to give up this achievement addiction, this uh, perfectionism as a value system, instead of telling yourself, I have to be perfect or my worthwhileness as a human being depends on my achievements, what new belief could you substitute so that you could keep all of those advantages, because we want all those advantages of being creative and working hard and, and, and producing a tremendous work. But to get rid of all of these disadvantages, could we just change the wording of that belief? What could we tell ourselves instead of my worthwhileness depends on my achievements, or I should always try, try to be perfect. This is just a kind of a fifth grade level modification, but it, it can be a little little challenging. And then once we've got a new belief, how do we turn that into an emotional reality? Right. So um, uh, there's an expression you use, which I love, but uh, I'd rather hold back on sharing that until we get some suggestions. From yeah, our, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Friends, right. So, yeah. so let's uh, let's keep talking for a couple of minutes as we get some activities there. By the way, as people are answering that question, and so again, the exercise, folks, that David, you've just shared with everybody is to use chat to share with us what would be an alternative belief that you would feel would help you eliminate the disadvantages of this belief, right, David? Is that sort of the exercise? That's right. Yeah, a new what value instead of my worthwhileness depends on my achievements. What what could I tell myself instead of that? Or I should always try to be perfect. What, what can I tell myself in, in, instead of that? Is, is there yeah. another way to, to look at it to where I can still, you know, be motivated to work hard and, 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 and love creativity and, and love achievements and, uh, and uh, you know, bring out the best that I have to offer the world w without this, this system that, that might not be working so well for me? All right. So let's pause a minute and we, we will see uh, things come in. Um, actually, I, th I think they already are. Um, let's see. So here is an attempt from Anna. I will do my best recognizing that I am a human being and my best will change on any given day. I will be kind to myself. That's a good one. I love that one. Yeah. Okay. Rahul is saying... Uh, by, by the way, uh, uh, just to, uh, uh, edit. Sometimes we can edit these. I never try to do my best. You know why? Why? Because you'll only do your best one time in your whole life. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I'm not trying to do my best right now. I'm trying to have fun with Hitendra. <laughs> you know, but but that's a good step in, in, in the right direction for for sure. Uh, right. Perfect, perfect. So so here's Rahul saying perfection reminds me of Richard Bach's writing. Are you telling me that even though it's changing every second, the sky is always a perfect sky? It speaks to what you were saying that uh, that you know when you're constantly evolving and changing. Like, what is that definition of best or yeah. perfection or what have you? Uh, Sandeep is saying I should pick only one thing in which to be perfect. Oh, that's well, you're, that's one step away from enlightenment. <laughs> you're, you're still <laughs> you're trying try to be perfect, but maybe just instead of in everything in, in one thing. My, my own, I, I'm not. I'm always making sure I'm not perfect. I, yeah. I don't want to be perfect in anything. Yeah, I love this. Um, you know, thought from Abhinay. It's very logical and very perceptive. Isn't perfection leaving no space for improvement? Yeah, if that's you're right. you're perfect. Yeah. The day you achieve perfection, that's the day you want to die, I guess, because there's no more, no more adventure and, and excitement. I screw up every day in so many ways, and some yeah. of them 
it may, may make me sad. Some of them are just trivial, but those yeah. are the opportunity for for, for growth and, and for, 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 for intimacy. Uh, sometimes I'm, I have so many flaws, but sometimes I'm, I can be insensitive. Sometimes I can be extremely sensitive, uh, but when I'm insensitive, you know, I hurt somebody's feelings and, uh, and when I see that, it's just, it causes so much pain for me. And then I can talk to that person and say, I just think I, I, I really hurt your feelings. And it's, it's, it, I just want, you know, I, I love you and I really care about you. And, uh, it, 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 and so it, it can be a path to, to greater intimacy as, as well as to, to far greater achievement. Um, yeah, yeah. It that, reminds me of a um, moment in the life of, um, Nehru. Nehru was India's first prime minister and a, um, you know, a highly uh, loved figure for his, um, you know, contribution to India's independent struggle against Britain, during which he went to prison for long periods of time. And in some of those, he wrote long letters to his daughter to recount the history of uh, civilization and the world and India. And uh, part of his, uh, you know, kind of uh, very humble demeanor in those letters was just this one that you mentioned, which is that, um, I, I don't know everything and I want to be very mindful of that. And in some ways I'm grateful for that because it gives me a hunger and a quest to keep learning and growing. And isn't that a great thing to never reach that stage where you kind of like pretty much know everything. So absolutely. The, the, the mindset that is kind of helpful for me is, is I can really enjoy work and productivity and achievement and creativity. But uh, if I, if I, achieve something terrific that that doesn't make me more worthwhile than, than anyone else and, and if I fail it doesn't make me any less w worthwhile and failure uh, can be a, a great opportunity for for learning and and and, and growth and uh, I'm not uh, striving for perfection as for perfection I, I can still strive for for doing something outstanding or, or for doing you know exceptional exceptional work, where would we be without, uh, you know, an Einstein or an Edison who worked tirelessly uh, in the, in the relentless pursuit, not of perfection, but, but of, 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 of productivity and, and, and achievement. Uh, and, and so uh, that, that would be the type of thing to give yourself a value system. I, I can still, you know, really love uh, be, being creative and, and to tell you the truth, since I've given up, you know, this achievement addiction and perfectionism, it, it, my productivity has just sky, skyrocketed. I, you know, there's so much going on now in my life that's exciting and creative and productive. I can barely keep up with it, to, to, to be honest with you. Uh, but, but, you know, they, I, I'm no longer afraid of failure or making mistakes. I'm working on an app with some uh, colleagues. And uh, one of the things I lo love about our cultural uh, you know, climate that, that we've created is, is that it's it's okay to be wrong, to, to, to fail. And, you know, I edit things. I send it to my colleague, Jeremy, and he said, you know, this kind of sucks here. It's, it's getting boring. And, you know, and I said, you, you're right. Let's, how could we liven this up? Let, let's make it dramatic. Let's, let's make it exciting. And then we come up with a, with a, with a cool, a cool idea. It, it gives you so much dynamism. I, I mentioned I, I learned a lot of this from my from my cat Obi as as well, who has been was one of my spiritual teachers, and he was this uh, this feral cat who used to come into our yard and tyrannize our cats. He was aggressive. He was living in the woods behind our house, and we would I would scream at him, and we'd chase him out of the woods and out of out of the yard, and and then one day he came to our kitchen door, which you you've been there. It's a glass door to the deck. And he was at that door, and uh, and and I said, "Why would he come? He's afraid of me." I looked at him, and he, he was looked like he was about to die. He he was suddenly become like a <clears throat> concentration camp victim, skinny, and he held his paw up to, to me. And I know he was so afraid, but he held his paw up so I could see it, and and it was swollen as big as his head, and he'd been in a, a fight. And he was on the verge of death because he could no longer hunt. And so my wife and I captured him, which he wanted, and, and took him to the vet. They did surgery and saved his life. They found a puncture, an infected puncture wound. And to make a long story short, uh, 
uh, he, he kind of decided, uh, you know, with much ambivalence that, that he was hoping we would adopt him. And, uh, but he was terrified. He was violent. You couldn't get within 10 feet of him initially without him hissing. If you tried to get close to him, he would, he would bite you r really ag aggressively. Uh, but eventually we lured him into the house and he became my best friend in the world. And he, he would, came, he just became so trusting. They say a feral cat can never become trusting, but he became my best friend and he would sleep on my chest and get up in the middle of the night and start kneading on my, on my chest. And then, he, then he'd start drooling on me and he'd drool so much, he'd shake his head. And it was like being in a drool shower. And if you're not a cat lover, you, you don't know how wonderful that can be. But, what, but see, he was not special. He wasn't perfect. He was just a cat from the woods. We used to call them alley cats. And I wasn't special. I'm just getting old. I can't even jog very fast anymore. I'm so slow, I call it slogging, slow jogging. But when I was with a OB, it was like the heavens opened up. And I wasn't trying to be special. He wasn't trying to be special. But the world became special. And it was such a, a, such a beautiful lesson. And uh, he was with us for eight or nine years. And then he was feral and he, he wanted to go out for a couple hours every night and do his hunting and, and one morning at six he, he would usually come to our bedroom door at six and rattle the screen and then we'd let him in he'd get in bed with us and he, he wasn't there at six and i knew probably the mountain lion behind our house had gotten him and we never found him and i lost my best friend in the world but i always remember him and he, he was my he was my teacher, and every day when I go out and jog, I shout out, Ooby, Ooby, a couple of times. And I know he won't come out from behind the bush, but I think, well, maybe he's in some kind of cat heaven and can hear me and, and, and know how much I love him. And my new book, Feeling Great, which you can see behind me on that table, is uh, dedicated to Obi, and his picture is in there. and. Uh, and, and so he just, he, you know, when you're ready to learn something, I guess they, they say a teacher appears and, and, and he was, he was a real teacher for me. What a beautiful story, David. Um, you got me and I'm sure all of us so, so deeply moved, so deeply moved by so much in that story. Uh, Obi, you know, as a, a presence in your life, as a, expression of just such beauty and grace in nature that any of all of us you know possess if we have the conditions uh, within and without to draw that out your capacity to see that and to connect with it and to celebrate it honor it nurture it and continue to continue to stay with it even uh, beyond uh, you know beyond the material presence right of the of this beautiful spirit in your life and the testament it gives to all of us that uh, worthiness is just something that i guess would you say it's like all of us just innately possess life innately possesses the un universe has in every every atom of creation yeah there's a deeper level that uh, it's, it's hard to see when you're young uh, and you're striving and achieving and uh, uh, but uh, but the, the, i guess the message is that seeing this has not made me less effective and productive but more more effective even in my teaching I used to think oh I've got to impress people with my I'm such a great teacher I've got all these techniques I've, I've, I've developed but I find that when people uh, when I express my vulnerabilities and talk to my students example of how I failed with, with this patient or that patient or, or, or with my my family or, or whatever oddly enough that's when people seem to to appreciate me the most. And again, that, that was a huge shock to, to the system and another beautiful thing to, to find out because that's when the magic happens in the, in the teaching or when I work with one of my students live and do therapy in front of the class as a, as a way of teaching. And when that, these are like Stanford students and they're all trying to be perfect and they're all living. Well, what if someone finds out how, how insecure I feel inside? And, uh, and then when they, reveal that finally when we're doing live work 
and generally they're they're, they're tearful and, and admitting, and then they think everyone's gonna gonna judge them for not being good enough, and then they're always shocked. They they get the greatest outpouring of love and support from other people, and 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 they kind of discover that their vulnerability, their flawed side, is actually their their path to enlightenment and and, and to love and and to, and to inner peace. It's another paradox. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, David. We're receiving some really um, heartfelt, um, you know, expressions of gratitude for this conversation with you today. As we come to the close of the hour, what a beautiful story and set of thoughts to help us, you know, reach a capstone moment, you know, in, the, in this hour's journey. Just to kind of briefly summarize, I think what we are all carrying away from this, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of these um, attempts I'm making to kind of like synthesize our, um, you know, our conversation with you. The first part was around just the um, central, important, but yet like invisible role beliefs play in our lives and in our satisfaction in our work. Uh, some of them tend to be self-defeating in nature. You compile the list of about 23 of them and organize them in a form that all of us, I think, are finding very accessible. And you know, many of us raised our hands and said, here's a belief I relate to or that one, Superman, Superwoman, achievement addiction were some of the very, perfectionism were some of the very common ones that we were seeing here. Um, and that there's a way to actually then analytically and scientifically, you know, go after this. You know, the spiritual traditions of the world have encouraged us to kind of like, you know, cleanse that inner landscape, but you're giving us really practical tools, really logical step-by-step ways in which we can self-apply a certain kind of way to advance our consciousness, right, towards that higher state of enlightenment where we awaken to a new world, a new reality. And the cost-benefit analysis approach is what you're recommending here. Lay down the benefits, lay down the cost, give yourself a score. If you think it's like, you know, too many, I mean, much more of a benefit to you than a cost, make peace with it and, and embrace it and keep going with it. But on the other hand, if the costs are substantive, uh, then, then here is one thing you can do, which is just... Um, Create a new belief, and you know, and phrase it and um, lay it out, you know, in your words and your thoughts, in a form that you know eliminates as much of those costs as possible, right? And then you took the example of this um, achievement addiction, you know, uh, and perfectionism, you know, that class of beliefs, and laid out for us the costs and the benefits and the ways to kind of, you know, if you do see the costs as being higher, you know, how to come to a higher place where your self worth. At least yourself, but it's not that you're stopping from pursuing, you know, ambition and drive and, you know, enjoyment and great work, but you're you're not doing it with hitching your self-esteem cart, you know, to that to that horse. Great summary, thank you, and and also all of you writing in and thanking us for the show it means a lot to me. Really, really appreciate your kind comments. Yeah. Thank you for all the you know transformative work that you're doing, David. I want to you know encourage all of us if you are drawn to you know going deeper into this work because uh, we only scratch the surface here, even with Dave, uh, David's uh, you know wonderful presence. Uh, the book that uh, David has just uh, you know published, "Feeling Great," as a more updated you know version of the work that he's been doing over these you know incredible decades of contribution the earlier book being Feeling Good, and then a whole stream of contributions in between. Feeling Great is a great way to get a pathway into the practice, the stories. David, you're always replete with so many stories, you know, in these books as well, that you write so beautifully in such a heartfelt way, just like you've shared so graciously here. So I know that's going to be not just for your own selves, but if there are loved ones and colleagues, you know, that you have, this could be a great gift for anybody who you feel is open and interested to want to self-evolve. So grateful for having all of you here with us today. Thank you so much for this conversation, David. Look forward to a moment in the future where we can then bring you back to talk about in a personal. Uh, you know, yeah, right. we'll do that. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Hatama. Take care. Take okay. care, everyone. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, thank you, David, again. Great joy. Perfect.